My guest lost nearly 300 pounds without stepping foot into a gym. He's the host of the Exam Room podcast, and he is the weight loss champion. His name is Chuck Carroll. Chuck, how you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Thank you. It's great to talk to you. I was telling you off the air that uh, uh, the story that you have to tell, man, you should write a book. <laughs> because uh, as we'll get into here, and as I told you off camera, more and more people you hear about losing you know, 50 pounds or maybe 100 pounds, but you took it up a notch. And uh, I think a lot of people will be interested in this story. I want to start by uh, talking about your weight battle from the beginning. Like, how did you initially gain weight? How old were you when you initially gained weight? And uh, what kind of led to that all happening? Oh, man. Um, I was very young when I started to gain weight. I mean, matter of fact, I was still in elementary school, probably second or third grade the first time I crossed that 100-pound threshold. And um, I remember we had this program uh, where every student at the school got, you know, weighed and they had their height taken, they had their fingerprints taken, and it was done by the police, you know, in case you go missing, they had all of your records. But when I stepped on the scale that day and it said, you know, you were like a bucko two, I remember being mortified and I looked at the person who was writing all of this down and I was like, I got to go on a diet. I'm not even 10 years old talking about I need to go on a diet. Right. And I, I had no way, like, I just couldn't comprehend that what it was I was eating at that point was actually driving me to become heavier and heavier. And that just continued all the way, you know, into my 20s when I got up to 420 pounds. It was just a crap ton of fast food um, and unhealthy food, uh, thanks to my grandma. God love her. I mean, she <laughs> just fixed everything with bacon grease. She had a jar of bacon grease on top of her stove, <laughs> yeah. and it didn't matter what she was fixing, man. Everything was in there. So um, that's that's just the way it was. High fat, high calories all day, every day, man. Now, I know that you tried many times to lose weight, uh, and this is a very relatable story. I mean, I can relate to it. I think most can, where you try to lose weight. Maybe you lose a little bit. You end up gaining it all back again. At your peak, uh, and you just mentioned this, you were 420 pounds, you're five foot six, you had a 66 uh, inch waist, and you were consuming uh, around 10,000 calories a day. Tell me about what life was like for you at that time, like what day-to-day -day life was like. Oh man, it was, uh, it was hard, but at the same time it was normal because it was all that I knew. Um, when I was at my heaviest, I could barely walk 10 feet without starting to feel my chest tighten. Um, I would start to sweat as if I had just run a marathon, even though it was just a couple of feet. And um, that was the scary part to me. That was the wake up call. But before that, I mean, it was I almost felt like I had to be that big guy because I was working in radio and I was working at the radio station, big 100.3 here in Washington, D.C. Swear to God, it was WBIG. <laughs> so it was like so fitting. Yeah. And so I felt like I needed to be big Chuck in order to advance my career. So that's kind of what I, I used, or at least I told myself, um, was okay then to go ahead and keep going through the drive through multiple times a day or eating two and three pizzas at a clip, you know, and getting up to that 10,000 calorie threshold. I, I still didn't realize at this point that I was like straight up addicted to food, like it was cocaine or something, but um, it, it was rough, man. And um, not a lot of confidence when it came to the ladies either. And so <laughs> yeah. that, that was rough, man, being, being in your twenties and, and like not dating. Yeah, yeah, I can I can relate to most of that stuff. For me, it was mostly my teens because by my twenties is when I started to get under control. But I can totally relate to everything you're talking about. Uh, for you, it was September first, two thousand nine. You were twenty seven years old, and you made what must have been a pretty tough decision. You decided to undergo gastric bypass surgery. Tell me what led to you making that decision. It was it was a combination of things like everybody thinks that it's just one event, you know, that proverbial straw that broke the camel's back. Uh, no. Um, so for me, it was three things. One, it was like I was talking about being really scared for my health, knowing that I could only walk a few steps um, because my grandfather had died of uh, a series of heart attacks before I was even born. By that point, my father was already having heart issues, and I knew as I, I'm way heavier than either one of them ever were, so I'm really headed down that path and getting there rapidly. So not believing that you're going to live to see 30 years old is a hell of a motivator. And then there was just at that point kind of the embarrassment that if I didn't change my ways because I was putting on weight so quickly, I wouldn't be able to find pants that fit. 
hmm. anymore. Like not even from a big and tall catalog. I think they only go up to like a 72 inch waist. Mm -hmm. That was already at 66. So within a year, year and a half, I would have been out of that and, and housebound. And then there was a flight across country to San Francisco where I could not fit into the seat and I was all the way in the back of the plane and I hadn't flown since I was a little kid and I knew it was going to be a, a tough fit man but it was like I when I got on the plane I will never forget this as long as I live I felt like everybody kind of just stopped what they were doing it was as if the plane froze and everybody looked right at me and started to pray like I please God don't let this guy sit next to me mm -hmm. And so having to go all the way to the back of the plane, feeling mortified by that, sitting down, trying to get the seatbelt to, to close, not even coming close, and then having to get up, walk to the front of the plane, all of those eyes on me once again, ask for a seatbelt extender, uh -huh. and then tail between my legs, back to the uh, back of the plane, sit down wow. so that we could take off, man. That was rough. And then... I did actually at one point date a girl who begged me every day not to tell anybody that we were dating, not our friends. We had mutual friends. Uh, she didn't tell her friends. She didn't tell her family. She asked me not to tell my family. I, I did tell my family, but whatever. But I thought that that was as good as it was going to get for me. And that's kind of what I deserve for being so overweight. And this girl does not have a weight problem. So I'm just going to take what I can get, even wow. though it was like emotionally being kicked in the nuts over and over and over again. Wow. So when you add all of that stuff up, man, you put all of that together. That was the straw that broke the camel's back. That's crazy. So she was she didn't want you to say anything just because she was embarrassed at that time. That that is the only conclusion that I can draw. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I would yeah. love to know, do you, have, have, has that girl seen you uh, recently? Obviously, it's been years now since you lost weight, but. I know she's aware that I have lost weight, um, but I haven't spoken with her in quite some time. Wow. Wow. Tell me a bit about the surgery. Like, what does it entail? And is it the kind of thing where you see weight loss rapidly or is it a slow, gradual process? Uh, the surgery is interesting. Uh, the bypass part is because they literally reroute a portion of your intestine and they bypass another portion of it. So um, that helps with, um, you know, restricting the number of calories you can take and especially initially. Um, and then they also staple off a small portion of your stomach that winds up being literally about the size of your thumb initially initially and so you you can only handle liquids for a few weeks so yeah you do see pretty rapid weight loss because you can only take in four ounces of food or fluid at a time wow so yeah i mean it's it's pretty hardcore but here's where people think um here's where a lot of people who don't understand get weight loss surgery wrong is they think that is this magical cure, right? And it's permanently, you have a small stomach and there's no way you could possibly ever gain weight again. But the statistics show that nothing could be further from the truth because over time, your stomach is just like a balloon. So this little four ounce stomach suddenly becomes the size of a fist and then probably a fist and a half and it becomes a normal size stomach once again. Hmm. And so you, you see people like 75, 80% of people who have weight loss surgery wind up putting a significant portion of the weight back on over time. And the longer you stay out, the more weight gets put back on. I've seen that firsthand with members of my own family and it's hmm. heartbreaking people who have had this procedure and then put all the weight back on. And then some seen friends, the same thing. And they will even tell you that when you go to get the surgery, like if this one doesn't work, we can go back in and do another surgery. Really? Tighten things up a second time, which to me was asinine. So, uh, the procedure itself was, was rough, um, up front. Um, and, and, but I will tell you the best thing about that was that it finally enabled me to break my addiction to fast food. Like I was a Taco Bell freaking junkie and you get this three to six month window where you've, you just can't tolerate that kind of food. And so I, I was already feeling crappy because of the surgery. And then I, I didn't have to worry about that fast food detox because that's an actual thing if you want to talk about that fast food detox is real, real man hmm. so um you go through that and then it's you just kind of come to this point where do you want to go back to the way that you were or do you want to keep going down this healthier path and that's that's kind of a mental tussle but 
eventually, man, you just work your way back up to where you can eat just like anybody else. Very interesting. Well, when I read your story, uh, one of the things I thought was interesting was that you had a couple of chance meetings that kind of changed the course of your life. The first one was at a high school reunion. Uh, you reconnected with a girl from high school, and she uh, changed your life in terms of helping you eat clean. Tell me about that. Yeah, and this was a girl who I actually had a huge crush on back in high school. She was one of the it girls, you know, and um, the fact that she had been following my progress on Facebook, and I had no idea. Okay. So when I when I go to the 10-year reunion and I hear my name from across the room, Chuck, and um, it, it turned out to be her. And so we just started talking and she's like, oh, man, I'm so proud of you. You know, I'm doing health coaching now. Nutrition is my jam. So she's the one that really introduced me to, to clean eating and coached me up and taught me how to read ingredients, labels and um, things like that. And I was really, really grateful about that. So that took it a step further from just, you know, eating healthy to understanding exactly what it was you were putting in your body. Mm -hmm. And that to me is super important now. And so to her, I'm forever grateful. The relationship didn't quite work out, whatever it happens. But she she coached me up and um, God bless her for doing that, because without her, I'm not sure that you and I would be talking today. Very interesting. Well, the second meet chance meeting that you had came a couple of years later. Uh, and this is where you and I, again, uh, have stuff in common. So one, one of the sites that I own is Fightful.com, as you know, which uh, is a pro wrestling MMA website. You were working for CBS Sports. Uh, and you were assigned to interview a pro wrestler by the name of Austin Aries. Now, anybody that's listening to this who's not a wrestling fan, Austin Aries is pretty well known in that world for being a vegan. Uh, and so you were uh, assigned to interview him, and Austin Aries kind of ended up changing your life. Talk about uh, your meeting with Austin Aries and what happened. Oh, oh, man, Austin did change my life. I've never put it quite like that, but he absolutely did. Um, he was familiar with my story as well. We had spoken a, a few times previously because uh, he was on another radio show that I was hosting with the uh, NFL player here in town called Fourth and Pain. And that was a football and wrestling hybrid show. It was a lot of fun. But anyway, he's like, Chuck, I know that you're a healthy guy. I know that you've lost all of this weight, but man, you should really look at going vegan. And at that point, I wasn't eating a whole lot of uh, meat or anything like that. It was just chicken and fish. And I was drinking a ton of milk. But he's like, dude, you really need to do this. And here's why. Just go watch this documentary called What the Health. And I did that. And then I read uh, Austin's book uh, that he had just put out about his plant power journey through the wrestling industry. And it was really a, a smooth read. But once I watched that documentary and I, I understood even more about what it was that I was putting in my body and the negative and positive effects that it could have. I was like, holy crap, this makes a ton of sense. So I make the decision right then and there as the credits are rolling, like I'm going vegan, I'm giving up meat completely, I'm giving up dairy completely, I'm going to that next level. And I remember telling that to my wife and she just like blew a freaking gasket, man. She was like, you already eat so clean. Why in the hell do you possibly want to go vegan? You know, what is this guy Austin telling you? This is insane. <laughs> and I'm like, well, hold on, hold on. Let's just go watch this, this movie, right? And so she sat down and she watched it and she was like, oh my God. So she had the same epiphany that I did. And so she made the switch too. And so together we went plant-based and, um, I'll tell you, man, I'm so grateful to Austin for that conversation because I, for the past uh, three, four, five years, have never felt better. And it was funny, like I thought that I had finished with all of my weight loss. At that point, I was like right around 155, 160, mm -hmm. but I was still carrying around a lot of what I found out was just like extra fat on me still. And so when I adopted the plant-based diet, I lost another 15 to 20 pounds and just my health went through the freaking roof, man. It was just phenomenal. Wow. So you ended up going from about 420 to 140 pounds. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so almost yeah, 280, but that's, that's, that's incredible. That's incredible. Now you mentioned earlier how food is like a drug, which, which I completely agree with. You can be ad addicted to it just as you can alcohol, or as you said, cocaine. One story uh, that you told uh, in an interview that I thought was pretty telling was the cookie diet story. <laughs> Tell that story because I think that's very interesting and it goes, it goes along with what you're talking about. 
Oh man, the cookie diet was an all timer. Um, <laughs> so I was uh, I was still working at uh, Big One Hundred Point Three as Big Chuck, and the cookie diet people came in and they were like, "We're looking for somebody to do endorsements for us on the radio." And because I was Big Chuck, Big Chuck needs to lose weight. Let's go ahead and put him on this. Cool. The problem was the cookie diet was just god awful. Okay, it was like you eat this this what they call a cookie with a sprinkle of cinnamon and a, and a raisin in it, but it really tasted like the sponge on your kitchen sink. It was just <laughs> god awful. So you eat that for breakfast and lunch and you drink a bunch of water with these cookies and then you eat this sensible dinner. And they never tell you what a sensible dinner is. Just make sure that there are some vegetables on your plate. Cool, whatever. I'm being paid to do this. I'm going to do my best. Well, night one comes and I'm like, man, I, I'm really jonesing for some Taco Bell, but <laughs> I'm going to be I'm going to behave and I'm not going to do it. Night two comes and I'm starting to feel really sick at this point. That's what I was mentioning when I said detox earlier is like you start to go through withdrawals psychologically and it, it manifests then as a physical symptom as well. And so like that, that wasn't cool. And I was getting cranky. But then night three. Like I was a full blown, just jerk to be around and angry, angry because my brain was just freaking out because I wasn't getting my $20 a day Taco Bell fix, $20 a day. Mm -hmm. And, and so like, I remember just being so pissed off that I just, I jumped out of bed and I boom, put my fist through a wall. And like, I was so angry. I was like, nah, that didn't do it. So boom, I put my fist through a door and I was just like, son of a you know, and, and I just go and I, I lay back down and I wait for everyone to go to bed and I'm just praying nobody comes around me. And so in the middle of the night, then I snuck out and drove to the 24 hour drive through loaded up on my $20 of food and came back. And that was the day that I realized that I had a serious problem because when I took that first bite, I will never forget of that seven layer burrito um, I was like, I felt like this rush come over me, man. Like it was, a, it was just like a tidal wave of like, it was a warm feeling and suddenly my brain just instantly calmed down. And so I sat there pondering that, honestly getting emotional about it as I ate every single morsel of that $20 worth of Taco Bell. And I was like, damn, I'm in a bad way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I, I kept doing that every single night but I would also spend like two and a half, three hours a day in the gym to make sure that that weight came off. So the cookie diet people were still getting what it was that they needed to see as far as results. Wow. And how did that end up? Like, what was the end of the, the cookie diet story? Like, how did that finish up? Uh, eventually we just kind of parted ways, uh, when, when their endorsement, uh, or their, their buy ended. Um, so did the endorsement. So, um, as soon as I, I stopped eating those cookies for breakfast and lunch, uh, you know, that, that weight came pouring on. I will yeah. say because of all the time that I was putting in the, at the gym, like I had lost 60 or 70 pounds. So it's not like they could argue with the results that they thought were coming from the cookie diet. Um, but you take the, you stop paying me and I don't have to eat these cookies anymore. Well, guess what? I'm going to stop going to the gym too. Mm -hmm. And then it was like fast food for lunch, fast food for dinner. And it was just boom, all that weight came pouring back on. And that was actually the last diet I did, um, before I had the weight loss surgery. That's what catapulted me all the way up to 400. Really? Really? Yeah. So I want to talk about your plant-based diet because people might watch this and they might be intrigued by this. But I think that there are some, I don't know if stereotypes are the right word. There are certain things that people think of when they think of a plant-based diet. Uh, one is it's going to be hard to prep. Another is it's going to be expensive. So tell me about, say, your typical day when it comes to a, a plant-based diet, what kind of stuff you eat, and talk about the prep time. Yeah, it, so there's really not a whole heck of a lot of prep time to it. And the thing is, people think it's hard, but then it, the thing I always like to say is, all right, well, tell me what it was that you've eaten today. And I'll be like, oh, that's vegan. That's vegan. That's definitely vegan. Vegan, vegan, vegan. So like they've probably eaten four or five things that are already plant-based that day and just it never registered. So once you kind of make that connection, it's like people are already like, ah, that anxiety comes down. 
Um, and so that's that's very helpful to know that it's not this huge dramatic shift that everybody believes that it is. Hmm. Um, but as far as me, like I love oatmeal and fruit in the morning. Um, I will load up a big old bowl of just like straight oatmeal um, and then put some cold fruit in there, frozen fruit. So it like cools it down. Mm -hmm. And so it's just like ready to eat straight away. Um, and that's pretty cool. Right. Um, so that's typically bananas, uh, strawberries, blueberries in there. Um, sometimes a little bit of granola on top of the oatmeal as well, if I wanted a little extra sweet there. Um, and then that's, that's breakfast. Lunch is typically something like, uh, roasted vegetables and beans and rice or something like that. Something simple. Cause I'm working all day. Um, and that I can just heat up really, really quickly. Um, no big deal, but you know, and, and then lunch, uh, dinner for me is typically just an enormous freaking salad with like everything that I have in, in the uh, refrigerator just goes on top of a bunch of greens, but hmm. I'm weird like that. Right. It doesn't have <laughs> to be like that for everybody. Yeah. Cause I, you know, for my wife will fix all kinds of, you know, veggie burgers, um, like mock tuna is a, is another fun one. Um, y you can do pasta for days, like any kind of chili, as long as it doesn't have meat. And they got so many different kinds of meat substitutes now where y they taste damn near identical. Like if people are going to Burger King and getting the impossible Whopper and they're enjoying it, people who have been eating Whoppers their entire lives and enjoy this, man. Well, guess what? It's not just limited to burgers, man. It's every single thing that you could possibly imagine. Hmm. So it's super, super, super easy easy and then if you keep your menu on the simple side as well you can also keep the cost down like on one of the episodes that i did of the exam room i went through a grocery store a boutique grocery store in washington dc and we filled up the cart with enough groceries to fill uh to feed two people for an entire week and it came out to something like 42 dollars. really yeah and it was like good stuff man it was like vegetables peanut butter oatmeal uh, which is cheap rice beans they're cheap too and you'd be surprised at how far you can stretch your dollar eating a plant-based diet it's it's really insane hmm. you run into trouble you know spending your entire paycheck when you buy fruit that's already pre-cut or you want to buy those impossible whoppers for every single meal um, and that's where stuff really, really, really gets expensive. And of course, they put a premium anytime they add quinoa to something, which is just hysterical. <laughs> but y you know, I mean, you can keep it. You can keep it cheap, man. You absolutely can. Now, I, I want to ask you about protein because there's another famous pro wrestler that I know you know named Daniel Bryan. Uh, and again, for anyone who's not a wrestling fan, Daniel Bryan was another well-known or famous vegan in that world. I don't know his situation today, but I know that at one point he decided to incorporate meat back into his diet because he was on the road a lot uh, for pro wrestling. And he found that at night trying to find uh, plant based protein was difficult for him. And so he had to put meat back into his diet. Talk about protein. Uh, how do you get enough protein on a vegan based diet? And that is the number one question for vegans. Um, it it, it's really easy. All right. So um, people think you can only get meat for, uh, or protein from meat and dairy. And that's not true. Um, literally everything that you eat has some level of protein in it. And you eat something like beans have a crap ton of protein in it. Like that is where I get the majority of it. Um, or grains, you know, quinoa is actually a complete protein. Like you get the same, you get all of your essential amino acids in quinoa the same way that you would by eating chicken or steak or something like that. And so I get it, the opportunity, man, to talk to doctors all day, every day as part of my job. And they practice medicine and they practice it on people who are vegan and a lot of people who aren't. The majority of their patients aren't. But with their vegan patients, they have never, ever, ever seen a protein deficient person and none of them are taking protein supplements. It's mm -hmm. not like they're eating protein shakes mm -hmm. uh, in the morning or anything like that. They're just eating a regular diet. Nuts have a ton of protein in it. You know, beans, rice, greens have protein in them. It's it, it, the protein is just everywhere. And so, you know, once you realize that it, the protein question kind of goes out the window. Very interesting. Now, I understand that you're also affiliated with the PCRM, the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. And I read something about how you even did a speech on Capitol Hill. Tell me about them. What it, who are they and what do they do? This is actually a pretty large um, nonprofit organization uh, whose mission it is to um, really coach up 
uh, doctors and dietitians out there, healthcare workers who uh, don't know a whole heck of a lot about nutrition and diet. Because believe it or not, when a doctor goes to medical school, they spend exactly zero credit hours learning about nutrition. What they learn is how to treat the symptoms, but they don't learn how to prevent them from being there in the first place. And so what the Physicians Committee does is really work on teaching people preventative medicine, eating well so that you don't get diabetes, so that you don't get heart disease, you lower your risk for cancer and all of these other chronic diseases that are just plaguing Americans right now. And so with cancer running in my family, heart disease running in my family, Alzheimer's running in my family, obesity running rampant in my family, like their message really spoke to me. And so when they reached out and they asked me to speak on Capitol Hill, myself and that football player, Adam Carricker, um, we were doing the show and they reached out, we, we did a PSA and I wound up speaking on Capitol Hill. That's when I first learned about them. And when I was ready to stop being a regular news guy um, and reporting on death and destruction all day, I wanted to do something cool. I pitched the idea for doing the exam room and, um, you know, here we are three and a half years later, and it's it's among the most downloaded nutrition podcasts out there. Really? That's great. That's great. And I understand that football player, uh, he was the one that coined you the weight loss champion. He is. He is. <laughs> um, that was that was a hard one for me to start with initially, man, because I'm not really a, a bragger, you know, but he's like, dude. If you have anything to brag about, it's this. You've lost so much freaking weight. You yep. know, you are the weight loss champion. I was like, if you say so, you know. And plus, he was like a good foot taller than me and it had 150 pounds of muscle on me. So who the hell am I to argue with this guy? <laughs> so the weight loss champion I went with and it kind of stuck. Yeah, no, I definitely think that you need to uh, document your experience in a book. Uh, and I, like I said, I think that people would be interested in how you did it because of the fact that you didn't spend five hours a day in the gym. In order to do it, it was just changing your lifestyle and changing the way that you eat. You know? Yeah, man. Uh, I was anti-gym um, because I associated a gym with every failed diet that I had ever had, just like the cookie diet. Mm -hmm. And so um, I, I just started by walking, man. And it was just across the street. And then I built up to where I could walk around the block and then two blocks. And then eventually over time, it, it graduated all the way to five miles every single afternoon on my lunch break. And come hell or high water, rain, snow, sleet, it didn't matter. I was out there walking. And um, my job at the time, they were so cool about it. They were like, take that extra half hour, make sure you get in all of your steps at lunch. Wow. And you can make that up on the back end of the day. And so that's what I did. And then I never had to worry about dragging my tired ass to the gym after work. That's mm -hmm. the trap, man. Like people are already tired after they put in those eight, nine, 10 hours. Who's going to want to go to the gym? Not a lot of people. So if you build that into your workday, man, it makes it so much easier. For sure, for sure. I mean, it's one thing if you're Dwayne Johnson and you're getting 20 million a movie and <laughs> you have a personal trainer that's going to knock on your door at four o'clock in the morning. If you're a regular person, I agree with you. After you put in a full day of work, you don't want to go to the gym after that. Nah, you know? man, it's, it's time for rest at that point. Definitely time for rest. Well, for more information on Chuck's story, as well as weight loss tips, you can check out the weightlosschampion.com. Uh, you can also find his podcast there. It's called The Exam Room by the Physicians Committee. And again, I've been talking to the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll. Great talking to you, man. You got a great story. Thank you, my friend. All right. Thank you. Take care.